Welcome to Portico, everyone. It's great to join with you. Uh, even though we're physically separated, we get to worship together today. And a very happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there, as well as a heartfelt prayer for those who've lost children, lost their mother, or, or have struggled to become a mom for various reasons. Uh, we know this day can bring both encouragement and, and soberness depending on your situation. So a big thanks for all the moms out there. You mean so much to your families and the body of Christ. We're grateful for you. Uh, before we get started, uh, I wanted to remind everyone uh, to go to our website, uh, porticoseville.org, to learn more about our church updates and to complete the How We Can Help You form should you have any special need during this time. So today uh, we get to hear from Pastor Bliss teaching from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 31. Uh, verses 1 through 8. From this passage, uh, we're going to learn how God is promising to go before his people and that he will be with them always. Sounds pretty relevant, right? So we'll get to peer into God's heart in this passage, and we get to hear how these promises of God are not some sort of transactional guarantee. Rather, they are a revelation of who God actually is and, and what God wants to do in our lives. This promise, of course, reaches its highest fulfillment in, in the coming of Jesus, God incarnate, who enters into sin, death, and evil before us, who conquers sin, death, and evil, and who promises in John 14 to send the Holy Spirit, which will mean the very power and presence of God with us. May our souls be nourished by this teaching today. May our voices be lifted up in worship, and may our hearts be encouraged. As we open up our time in prayer, I'd invite you to stand as some of our Portico family reads Psalm 121. Let's turn our hearts and attention towards God. Pray with me. Jesus, we come together, even though physically separated, but together in unity as a church to worship you, to learn from your word, and just understand more about what it means to be uh, in love with you and understand the power of your gospel. We pray uh, our church uh, hears these words and is able to lift our voices uh, in unison and worship all across our homes, all over the greater Charlottesville area and beyond. May this time bring you glory and honor and praise. Thank you in your name. Amen. I lift my eyes up to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will, he will not, not let, let your foot, foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The, the Lord is your keeper. The, the Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore.
Hey, well, good morning, Portico Church. Uh, I'm Pastor Bliss, and I've got Janet with me today, uh, who is on staff with us and one of our uh, covenant investors. Um, we, uh, well, Janet, first and foremost, happy Mother's Day. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Uh, I, part of what I wanted to ask Janet to share a little bit about today is a story about the Holy Spirit. That, that really is in many ways the central theme of the sermon this morning. And so I wanted to, uh, Janet and I had had a conversation uh, actually last week before I knew uh, what I'd be preaching this week, and uh, it revolved around the Holy Spirit. And so I asked her to share if she was willing. Uh, I'm super thankful for that. Uh, and so Janet, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you talk, uh, but sort of to, to sort of kick us off, I, I was wondering if you'd be willing to sort of go into a little bit the short, the story you shared about your family and the discussion around the Holy Spirit that was happening, I think, on the deck. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, so it happened a couple weeks ago. We were just planning to just have an afternoon being outside. And uh, it was Ethan and Emily and Greg and myself on the deck. And um, Ethan just started the conversation with a question. And he asked Greg about a, a time that Greg had prayed over um, a friend's son who had been uh, emotionally and mentally in a dark place that had really turned into more of a physical illness too. And the family had tried lots of things and just asked Greg, will you please come and pray in hopes of him being healed? And Greg did. And Ethan just wanted to hear, you know, the story. What did that look like? What did it feel like? What did the Holy Spirit do? And, and um, the boy was healed. And mm. so it, it was just, he just wanted to hear. He knew it had happened. It had been 10 to 12 years ago. And he wanted to know what did that look like? And so after we talked about that we kind of moved in the direction of the holy spirit and the gifts of the spirit specifically the ones um we were in for, greg was actually reading from first corinthians 12 and we were talking about the gift of healing and the gift of speaking in tongues and the the gift of prophecy and and what does that look like and are we really are we really using any of those gifts today or asking for those gifts today so mm. we talked a little bit about that and then um I'll then begin to talk about some personal things recently that we had experienced as a family and that we had had a, just the week before we had, Greg was having a huge transition in his business, Greg and Ethan both. And we had planned to pray together that morning. And it was just a sweet time of prayer that none of us had spoken before the prayer time. We started praying at 10 o'clock and, and when we were done, it was everyone had just been praying in unison. It was clear mm -hmm. that the Holy Spirit had moved each one of us individually to pray a theme. And it was just a really beautiful time of prayer that I think just kind of shocked us all to see how the Lord had moved through that. So, mm -hmm. so we talked about that. And then we, we moved into a discussion about the power of the Holy Spirit and kind of just a general discussion about have we accepted a lot of brokenness in our world and said, that's just the way it's supposed to be instead mm. of, instead of asking for the power of the Holy spirit to be able to, to heal some of that brokenness, whether it be physical, emotional or whatever. So just, uh, that was kind of the direction of that whole conversation mm. for us. Yeah. I love that. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, and, and then the second thing that we had sort of talked about a little bit, but love to kind of hear some more on is how you've been experiencing, especially in a season of quarantine and isolation and just the disorienting space we're all in. Um, I think again, sort of even like off of your last point, it's been really easy at first for, for even me to kind of resign to just accepting it and not expecting things of the Holy spirit, even in a season yeah. like this. Um, uh, and yet, I think there are some things that he wants to do. And so, yeah, kind of how have you been even experiencing and and um, seeing the Holy Spirit at work even in, even in this season? Yeah, um, I wrote some things down. So um, I'm going to kind of keep an eye on that so I can Great. stay on task. <laughs> um, I think for me, I really have sensed the Lord wanting me to to live more in the power of the Holy Spirit, challenging me that maybe that's not where I've been living, even though I've been very much at his feet and, and, and listening and reading God's word. But there, there's been a prompting that um, just not sure, you know, what that's going to look like, but he's just asked me to be a little more intentional about the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit. And, and as far as this season, uh, my tendency 
is generally to operate a little more out of my emotions and my feelings. And so a season like this could kind of leave me a little bit paralyzed and in fear and not moving forward with the Lord at all, but just existing. And I really do feel that through the power of the Holy Spirit, I don't feel that way. And then the last two months, I feel there's been a, a trend, a tremendous amount of growth in me. And, and that, you know, that's been somewhat surprising, but also not surprising if that's what the Holy Spirit has wanted to do. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I really have seen him kind of coming in and kind of taking over my emotions and taking control of them daily. Hmm. So that's kind of, that's kind of one thing I've noticed. I've also tried to be more intentional of sitting still and, and you've helped with this in your prayer times during the week to just sit still, take some breaths and really invite the Holy Spirit to come. And that's not something I have typically done. That's just, you know, not, it just, it hasn't been. So I have been more intentional to really asking him to come and speak to me and um, repenting of what he shows me hmm. that I need to repent of to think about where he was with me and to think about places where I, he, he was trying to be with me and I was walking in the other direction. <laughs> and, um, you know, just letting him reign over all of that hmm. so that, you know, so that I just, so that there could be more joy and more just miracles kind of in my everyday life. Um, hmm. And I think I've always prayed in the morning and I have, I've prayed, you know, for years and I don't, I'm not saying that pridefully. I mean, I'm, I'm older, so I've been walking with the Lord for the long time, for a long time, but I, I really do sense that I've been trying to pray more in the morning throughout the day and at night. And it's, it's, that's not something I've always done. I have had a, a quiet time and there's been a lot of days I have my quiet time and I walk away and um, the Holy spirit is telling me that's, that's not a way to abide with me. You know, that mm -hmm. I want you to be with me morning, noon and night and, and not so much because you have to, but because mm -hmm. that's, that's the way you're going to know me more. And that's the way you're going to get through this season. And it's, it's going to be beautiful, but it's going to be a battle and you're going to, yeah. you're going to need me more than maybe mm -hmm. you have thought you have in the past. Um, and let's see. And I think there have been some things, even this, this season that he's, he's, he's asking me to do and, and, and to, and to speak and to be more courageous. That's been an issue mm -hmm. for me of, I have often thought that he has given me a gift of discernment and I have struggled with having the courage to speak the words that he mm -hmm. will tell me something very specifically and really want me to speak truth into someone's life. And I have, mm -hmm. I have recoiled and, and just mm -hmm. not had the courage to be able to do that. And he's given me some opportunities to, um, <laughs> you know, be faithful to do what he's asked me to do. Mm -hmm. so. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and, and um, you were sharing some of those things before we hit the record button, but what struck me then is the same thing that sort of strikes me now, which is this, um, just the gentleness of the Holy Spirit, the faithfulness of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit doesn't wrangle, that there is this uh, cooperation and in inviting him in, uh, being willing to be still and wait, that there are things that he wants to do that I think he waits until we invite him in to begin some of those, those good works. And so, yeah, I'm just, I'm resonating with a lot of what you're, of what you're saying and actually really appreciate that. And I'm just so thankful for your willingness to be courageous. This is being courageous and, yeah. <laughs> and to be vulnerable and to share a little bit about, about that. And so, yeah. So thank you so much for, for doing that today. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. Well, uh, we're going to continue now in worship. Uh, and Janet, again, thank you. Happy Mother's Day. And uh, I'm so thankful for you. Thank you. Hey there, Florida family. Pastor Chris here. As we give our offering today, please consider... God's word from 2 Corinthians. The Apostle Paul said to the church at Corinth, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor 
of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us, 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 5. From this we see a couple of ideas. First, Paul commends cheerful giving even in a severe test of affliction. And second, our heart affections in giving go first to God in light of his provision, and then to provide for those who are in need. Really in this way, we fulfill the great commandment to love God and one another. I'm so thankful for our church family being so faithful to this word from God. Even from our homes, we can continue in a spirit of obedient and joyful generosity. I direct your attention to some ways to give. Please visit kulikosigo.org slash give to give right now. For those of you facing hardship, I encourage you to reach out so that we can share in generosity and see the provision of Christ meet needs. Thank you in advance for participating in this act of grace. Wherever you are, would you pause to pray with me now? Heavenly Father, we love you so much and we are so thankful for your grace to us in provision. We love you, and you are taking care of your church, both here at home and around the globe. I'm thankful for that. And Lord, I pray that you would stir in us, your people, uh, to continue to give obediently first to you in gratitude. And then, Lord, to see your grace go out and meet needs. So, Lord, we are so thankful. We love you. And say thank you again in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hello, I'm Kendra Ayler. I'm the director of Portico Kids at Portico Church. I'd love for you to join me in your Bible in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 1 through 8. So Moses continued to speak these words to all Israel. And he said to them, I am 120 years old today. I am no longer able to go out and come in. The Lord has said to me, you shall not go over this Jordan. The Lord your God himself will go over before you. He will destroy these nations before you so that you shall dispossess them and Joshua will go over at your head as the Lord has spoken. The Lord will do to them as he did to Sion and Og, the kings of the Amorites, and to their land when he destroyed them. And the Lord will give them over to you, and you shall do to them according to the whole commandment that I have commanded you. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, church. My name is Bliss. I am the pastor of ministry training here at Portico. Uh, it's my joy to be with you this morning in worship. And we're continuing in our teaching series on the promises of God. Uh, just a few moments ago, you heard uh, Kendra read a portion of Deuteronomy chapter 31. Uh, we're going to be focusing in our attention this morning on verse 8 of chapter 31 as the next promise of God that the Holy Spirit's inviting us to listen to and to think deeply about. And so what I'd like to do is actually reread that promise in verse 8. 
and then I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to invite us to think about a few things. And so listen with open ears to the words of the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 8. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit. I pray that as we think deeply about this promise, as we think deeply, Spirit, about what it is you want to do in our lives, uh, that you would just uh, give us a refreshed vision, a refreshed desire to see you at work in the moment we find ourselves. Father, I pray that the words of my mouth, I pray that the meditations of all our hearts would be precious in your sight. And we pray this through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, I want to speak, but before we really dive into this promise, I want to speak a little bit about the promises of God. I think it's important as we enter into and continue in this series, and even as we think about this promise, that we really think rightly about what the promises of God are not and what the promises of God are. Uh, Firstly, what the promises of God are not. They're not transactional agreements between us and God, sort of this, if you behave this way and act this way, you'll get these types of results. Uh, in that same vein, they're also not magic spells. They're, not all, they're also not these ways in which if we just have enough faith and believe and say these things over and over again and claim them, that somehow we'll conjure God to respond in a certain way. What the, no, what the, rather, what the promises of God are is they are revelations, I would argue, of two things. First, they're revelations of God's heart, of who God really is. And I think this is good for us. And one of the reasons why I'm excited about this series is because I think in many ways it's going to press against and undermine the false images of God that really drive our lives. Uh, the false images of God that we've inherited uh, because of our family of origin, because of our personality types, because of even some of the traditions that we've come out of. It's important for us to have the right view of who God is. And of course, there's no better picture of this than Jesus himself. Every image of God that we have has to be run through that filter of Jesus, who himself said, if you've seen me, you've seen God. The second thing that I think it reveals is what God wants to do. God isn't just seated on his throne at a distance watching. He's, at, he's present at work in our lives, in our communities, and in our churches. I think the promises of God have something to say about what it is that God actually wants to do. Maybe another way of saying this is I believe that God actually has something to say about our lived experiences. Not just something to say about our past and what he's freed us from, what he's forgiven us from, not just the future to which we are headed, but God actually has something to say in the present everyday moments in which we find ourselves. Uh, One of the dangers with the promises of God uh, is that they just stay in the past or they just stay in the future. But again, God has something to say about our lived experiences. And so there's a few things that I want us to notice about Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 8, this promise that God makes. Really, three things off the top. The first thing I want us to notice is that this is a promise that's made to a vulnerable people. Uh, The people of God have come out of Egypt. They've wandered through the wilderness after 40 years, and they're on the precipice of coming into the promised land. And they are a vulnerable people. They face an enemy over the other side of the river that uh, is a greater force than they are. They are limited by their wanderings. They are limited by what God has allowed them to bring with them, Uh, the, the things he's allowed them to have and not allowed them to have. And this has put them in a place of vulnerability. They are coming out of the wilderness and entering into a dangerous place. The second thing I want us to notice about this promise is that this is a promise that's being made to an anxious people. Um, How do I know that these people are anxious? Well, it's a theme that we get throughout all of uh, the Old Testament. Uh, It comes up in the book of Psalms. It comes up even in these stories. And things that come to mind are, are stories like Exodus chapter 32, where Moses goes up on the mountain. The people get anxious and fearful because he's taking too long. And so they turn to the golden calf. But I also know that they're anxious because one of the the things that anxiety preaches to us, one of the the bad news aspects of anxiety is that it preaches to us the message that everything is depending on me. Everything is dependent on you, that you're the only one who can help yourself. And as they are standing, getting ready to enter into dangerous territory, one of the things that we see time and time again with the people of God is they have this fundamental belief that it's all up to them. That will cause them to uh, oftentimes long for Egypt. 
Though God had set them free from it, there was something familiar about the previous bondage. And in a moment of anxiety and fear, the bondage, though it was still bondage, seemed more attractive to them because there was some stability there than stepping out in faith into the dangerous place with the Lord. Uh, The third thing about this promise that I want us to notice is, is the content of the promise. The promise is a promise of protection, it's a promise of presence, and it's a promise of commitment. Um, It's a promise from God of protection. The Lord says, I will go out before you. This just isn't a, hey, uh, a supernatural follow the leader. Rather, the statement that God's making here is, I will go before you into the dangerous place and I will be your protection. But it's also a promise of presence that the Lord will be with you. And again, this is a theme we see, I would argue, plays the central theme in all of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. This idea that God has created us to be with Him, He longs for us to be with Him, and He will go to any means necessary, from creating a garden, to sending Jesus, to the new heavens and the new earth, to be with us. And so this is a promise of presence. He'll be with us. But it's also a promise of commitment. He will not fail you nor forsake you. The idea that God is steadfastly committed to you and to me, his people. This promise reveals who God is. It reveals what God wants to do in the people's midst as they enter into the promised land. Now listen, y'all, their reality is there are a number of places that we could point to as as this promise reaches its fulfillment. It reaches its fulfillment in that God keeps his word as they enter into the land. The remainder of Deuteronomy, the story of Joshua and Judges, is a story of God's fierce commitment, presence, and protection towards his people and with his people, even when they don't reciprocate his love. So God fulfills this promise in the Old Testament. It's hard not to see this promise fulfilled in Jesus, that Jesus enters into sin, death, and evil and conquers. He brings with him life into the dead places. He protects us from sin, death, and evil. He's present with us. He's committed to us, even to the point of death on the cross. But one of the things that the the Lord has really brought uh, to my attention over and over again, as soon as I begin to really sit with and pray through this passage, is I think one of the important areas in which God has fulfilled this promise is in the giving of the Holy Spirit to you and to me, his New Testament people, the church. And so I actually wanna spend the rest of our time uh, talking about the Holy Spirit. In fact, I I wanna give you six concrete things that I believe the Holy Spirit wants to do in my life and wants to do in your life and in the life of the church. But before we get there, I wanna talk a little bit about the Holy Spirit. Because I think when we talk about the Holy Spirit, there's a lot of different things that come to our mind. For some of us, he's the crazy uncle. You know you're supposed to invite him to the party. He tells sometimes weird jokes and uh, isn't always socially aware, but you know you have to invite him there, but you're going to spend as little time with him as possible. Uh, For some of us, the Holy Spirit has sort of been boiled down to this warm, fuzzy feeling I might get while reading my Bible or while sitting in worship. For some of us, the Holy Spirit, the only role we think he plays in our lives is sort of this to tell us when we're doing something wrong. And yet, I want us to pay attention to how Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit because I think this is actually really important for our understanding. And Jesus talks a lot about the Holy Spirit. The entire book of Luke's gospel talks about Jesus as a spirit-filled man who himself was reliant on the Holy Spirit, baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. But in the Gospel of John is probably some of the clearest teaching we have from Jesus on the nature of the Holy Spirit. Uh, First, in in John chapter 14, uh, Jesus says, I'm going, but I'm going to go to the Father, and I'm going to ask him to send another. Uh, This word another literally means of the same substance. What Jesus is telling his disciples in John chapter 14 is is this, if you like me, you're going to like the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit and Jesus are are, are of the same substance, Uh, that that if you like Jesus, man, you're really going to like the Holy Spirit. Uh, The second thing is in John chapter 16, uh, just two chapters later, Jesus again talking to his disciples says, don't be afraid. If you love me, you'll follow my commandments. I'm going back to my Father. And then Jesus says, my Father and I are going to give you the Holy Spirit. If you like Jesus, you're going to like the Holy Spirit. And the second thing Jesus talks about when he talks about the Holy Spirit is the fact that the Father and the Son send him. They give him to us. 
And they don't just give him to us um, in some theoretical sense. But again, I think there are six tangible things that the Holy Spirit wants to do in my life, in your life, in the life of our church. And so I want to take some time to go through those now. The first is I think that the Holy Spirit wants to empower and transform us. The Holy Spirit wants to empower and transform us. I think there, uh, when it comes to life with God, to growing in Christ's likeness, to discipleship and walking with Jesus, uh, spiritual formation, any and every word you could use for this, I think there are two false, false gospels, two false good newses that we preach to ourselves here. Uh, the first is, is the false gospel of try harder, do more, climb the ladder. When it comes to life with God, to being formed into the image of Christ, if we can just try harder, do more, uh, some of us may not say this out loud in community group, but I think our lives betray this. We get up every single morning, we look back on the sins of the previous day, and rather than asking for the Holy Spirit's help, rather than asking the Holy Spirit to do a work, rather than creating space for the Holy Spirit to do work, we just sort of white knuckle it and go, I was angry yesterday, I'm not gonna be angry today. So you go in today going, I'm not gonna be angry, I'm not gonna be angry. And sure enough, something sets you off and you're sent right back into a cycle of shame. And so that's the first false gospel. We'll just try harder. We'll just do more. The second one, though, as I think one is a, is a lot more subtle, uh, is the do nothing gospel. Um, it's sort of this idea that we'll just believe the right things and character formation will follow. And yet time and time again in the gospels, you see Jesus really pressing on people to take responsibility over their actions. That belief, even in the Gospel of John, as you get toward John chapter 20, um, as John's sort of telling you the purpose of that Gospel, it, he says it's so that you would believe and that you would live a certain type of life because of that belief, as part of that belief. So those are the two false Gospels, kind of on the, the opposite extremes of one another. One's just try harder, do more. The other one's like really just kind of do nothing, make sure you believe the right things. And yet in Acts chapter 1, when Jesus, post his resurrection, promises the Holy Spirit to his disciples, he tells them to go back to Jerusalem to wait in the upper room, and that what they will receive is the empowering presence of the Spirit. I think there's an invitation for you and I there. Where are our, where are our upper rooms? Where are the places that we carve out in order to wait on the empowering, transforming presence of the Holy Spirit? Really, this gets at the heart of, of the disciplines. Uh, Dallas Willard, uh, who has taught me so much about life with God, this is the way he's always described the spiritual disciplines, that the spiritual disciplines are not uh, ways in which for you and I to try harder. They're not ways in which we, we sort of drive our belief deeper down into our bones, but rather they are spaces we create to allow the Holy Spirit, to allow the Father and the Son to do the work that only they can do. As Dallas was famous for saying, again, grace is not opposed to effort, it's opposed to earning. You and I haven't earned the love of God. We haven't earned the empowering, transforming presence of, of the Holy Spirit. But there's an effort that God invites us into to create those spaces so the Holy Spirit can do what only the Holy, y'all, what only the Holy Spirit can do. The, so the first thing is the Holy Spirit wants to empower and transform us. The second thing is that the Holy Spirit wants to remind us of God's unwavering commitment to us, of his steadfast love for us. This is at the heart of, of Romans 8, 15 through 16, where Paul tells us we've been given the Holy Spirit so that we would cry out, Abba, Father. Uh, this cry isn't just one of affection, uh, but it's a reminder that God is steadfastly committed to us. Pastor Chris last week talked about this idea of covenant. Covenant is a, a relational commitment. And this is the beauty of God is that God is committed to us steadfastly and faithfully, even when we are not utterly and deeply committed to him. This is the God that we see in Genesis chapter three after the fall, where he enters in and he's asking questions, where are you? That's a question of distance. That's a question of relationship. God is a God. He gives us the Holy Spirit. And one of the Holy Spirit's roles is to remind us that God is steadfastly committed to us. The third thing I think that the Holy Spirit wants to do is the Holy Spirit wants to soften hard hearts. In fact, I would argue that the Holy Spirit loves soft hearts. Y'all, things like cynicism, uh, things like uh, sarcasm, those are fruits of living in a really hard world. Uh, you and I live in a hard world. 
The world, even in the midst of this pandemic, even for me, feels a little bit harder. Uh, I think for some of you, it feels a little bit harder. For some of you, it feels overwhelmingly harder. And here's the danger of living in a hard world. Not just fruits like cynicism and sarcasm. Uh, The dangers of living in a hard world is that we harden our hearts. Uh, We begin to deaden our emotions because living in a hard world makes us feel things we're uncomfortable with. But here's the problem. When we begin to deaden emotions, uh, we don't know the difference between good and bad emotions. So we try to deaden the bad ones, but as a result, we deaden the good ones as well. Uh, in the midst of a hard world, in order to protect ourselves, because again, our anxiety tells us it's all up to us, we begin to put up walls. But again, our walls do not discriminate. Our walls keep out both the good and the bad. And again, this is uh, one of the things that I think is, is so beautiful and a promise, like uh, the promise of Ezekiel chapter 36, where the Lord promises to take hard hearts and to replace them with soft hearts. This is the work that the Lord longs to do in the deeper places. If we will wait, if we will be still, and if we will create space for Him to bring both healing and transformation. Uh, The fourth thing that the Holy Spirit wants to do is the Holy Spirit wants to move us. I think this is one of the reasons why soft hearts is so important. The Holy Spirit wants to do the work He wants to do, not just for our own sake, so that we're sort of floating around life like some type of um, 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 wise, emotionalist person, but rather the Holy Spirit wants to do the work He wants to do for the sake of others. Again, Acts 2, right? The famous story of the Holy Spirit falling on the disciples on the day of Pentecost. But what do you see happen after that? They don't stay in the room but rather the Holy Spirit moves them. The Holy Spirit wants to do something for the sake of others through his empowering transformation and presence. Y'all, the Lord wants to use you. Even in a season of pandemic and isolation and quarantine, there are things the Lord wants to do to use you if we'll just pay attention to his nudging and to his movement because the Holy Spirit wants to move us. Fifthly, the Holy Spirit wants to make us sturdy people. Uh, Jesus in John chapter 14 and 15 will refer to the Holy Spirit as a comforter. Now, oftentimes I think when we think the word comfort, we think someone putting his arm or her arm around our shoulder. And that is certainly one of the aspects of the Holy Spirit. But the word Jesus uses for comforter um, actually has its root in a word fortis. It literally means to fortify, to make sturdy. The Holy Spirit longs to make us sturdy people. Um, even as Pastor Chris preached last week in Jeremiah 29, 11, uh, the Holy Spirit longs to help us close the gap between believing that we have to know everything, that we've got to be know-it-alls and fix-it-alls and everywhere for alls. The Holy Spirit wants to stir up in us a deep-rooted trust that God is actually the know-it-all, that God is the everywhere for all, fix-it-all, and in that make us sturdy people. My mind immediately here goes to the image of the tree in Psalm chapter 1. The tree planted by streams of living water, producing fruit in season and out of season. For some reason, uh, as I was thinking about this, I thought about a palm tree. Uh, Palm trees, I actually found out two weeks ago, are not native to America. They're native to Hawaii. So I guess in that case, they're native to America, but not native to to the actual country uh, landscape here. Uh, but rather they're native to Hawaii. And one of the unique things about palm trees is that the way God created them and the way that they are made is to be able to withstand hurricane-forced winds. Y'all, I think there's a picture there for what the Holy Spirit wants to do. He wants to make us sturdy people who bend with the wind, who are thrown around by the rain, but do not break. Uh, The sixth and final thing that I think the Holy Spirit wants to do, and and really I think in in many ways this is one of the most important for the other five. Um, I actually thought about starting with it, but I want to end in this way. I think the sixth thing that the Holy Spirit wants to do is the Holy Spirit wants to reveal himself in quiet places. Uh, During this quarantine, my family and I have been taking a lot more walks in nature. And I've noticed, and as is probably obvious to some, a walk in nature with the kids is very different than a walk in nature with myself. There's not much about the forest that has changed. What has changed is there isn't the noise of kids. Uh, My attention isn't split into multiple different places. There are things that I can notice on my walks without children that I can't with children. Uh, Here's the reality I think that you and I probably know deep in our bones is we live frantic and busy lives. 
Uh, even in quarantine, I probably should have brought this with us, but in the first week of quarantine, I helped create a schedule for what our days would be like. And after one day, we were more exhausted than a normal day. We live busy, frantic lives, even in the midst of isolation. There are increased noise levels. There are things coming at us that is causing our lives to be full of noise. It's hard to pay attention to really anything else. But I'm also realizing that we live unexamined lives. And in some ways, unexamined lives, y'all, are not lives worth living. You and I move throughout the day really, really in many ways unaware of what we're feeling, unaware of of the thoughts, the ways of relating with other people unaware of even our anxiety, uh, unaware of what our fears are. We're sort of uh, moving through life like like I do with my kids in the woods where my attention is drawn to them. Uh, Their noise is causing uh, me not to notice the things that are around me. Y'all, we live busy lives. We live unexamined lives. But I think there's a call for you and I. There's an invitation here for you and for me to tend to an awareness of the Spirit in our lives, to tend to an awareness of God with us, the God who protects us, the God who is committed to us. Uh, The Irish church referred to the Holy Spirit as a wild goose. Uh, What they meant by that was that the Spirit is elusive. Uh, He's elusive and he's waiting for you and me to be still so that the Spirit would emerge. Y'all, I think that in many ways, the Holy Spirit is waiting on the edge of the forest of our lives, waiting to emerge, reveal Himself, and to do things that are unexpected that we have been longing for. The question for me in this season has been, will I slow down enough? Will I enter into the still and quiet places so that I can begin to pay attention to the transformation He wants to bring about, the empowerment the commitment of the Lord toward me, that my heart would be softened, that I might, I might be moved in the direction he longs for, that he might make me a sturdy person. Y'all, we have to make room for the Holy Spirit to do his work. But here's what I believe. I believe that the Holy Spirit is waiting to do a work in my life. He's waiting to do a work in your life. And he's waiting to do a work in our church beyond maybe what we could expect. Let's, as a people, enter into the still and quiet places. Let's create those places. Let's carve them. Let's seek them out that we might be still and know that God is God and that he is a God who loves us, is a God who is for us, a God who goes before us, who is with us, and who is committed to us. Let us make room to allow the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
blood. I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is great. Well, Portico, we're really grateful you spent this time with us today. Uh, some of you might have been a little distracted with your kids or your coffee might have spilled as you were taking notes. Don't worry. Today's uh, live stream worship service will be posted on our church website. Make sure you check that out. Uh, if you want to go back and rewatch it or just catch up on stuff you might have missed. For all of us, if you have questions or need to connect with us, please go to porticoseville.org slash contact. You can find our phone number and email information there, as well as a, a Get Connected form you can complete to get connected with uh, one of our church leaders. As we close today, uh, let's take heart and remember the great gift the Holy Spirit is to us during these times. And Jesus himself was called a Spirit-filled man. His Spirit now dwells within all those who call upon his name. And if you're not a believer in Jesus, if you haven't called out to him as your Lord and Savior, the invitation to you is there now. All those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. For all of us in Christ, let's not believe the, the lie of trying harder or simply being lackadaisical in our faith. Let's repent, cling to Jesus, and press in the, to the great gift that God has given us, his own spirit. Let me pray this over you, family. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. See you guys next week. <laughs>